Welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. Our very special guest today is Katie Hopkins, all the way from the United Kingdom. Katie is known to Americans as a friend of Donald Trump. She's been all over the news here, both in person and uh, remotely. She's the author uh, of a book that I urge you to go check out called Rude. Katie has a million and one opinions, and we're thrilled to have you with us. <laughs> thank you very much indeed for having me, and thank you for that very kind introduction. I appreciate it. I should mention uh, military intelligence. You're one smart cookie, so uh, I expect everyone to pay very good attention to what you're going to tell us today. <laughs> Bless your heart. Thank you. Yes, I always wanted to fight for my country, and I went through the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst, uh, was sponsored by the Intelligence Corps, and signed up for 35 years, actually, in the British Army. So, yes, I'm a, I'm a proud patriot through and through. Well, well done, and I'm, I hope your fellow citizens appreciate your service. So let's talk about that country. You have said fighting for my country, the military, and the media is your mission. Tell us what that means to kick this off. Yes, well, I started off wanting to fight for my country in the military where one should do that sort of thing. Um, and I've always had that motivation. I had to be, I had to leave the forces eventually because I'm also, I was also an epileptic and uh, therefore had to be medically discharged. I think between the military and myself, we worked out that an epileptic with an SA-80 automatic weapon might not be the finest idea to mankind. But uh, I carried on my fight. So um, by a winding and winding path that included uh, a stint on the British version of The Apprentice, which I had watched when I was in America working as a management consultant in Manhattan, um, I ended up in the British media. I became known as a woman with forced forthright and forceful opinions that were possibly not to everybody's taste. Uh, I am known for speaking out plainly as I see it and certainly for my country that I'm fighting for now. You know, my best way of summarizing that position is that I am a white, Christian, conservative, straight, married mother of three children and I am proud of all those things. And all those things are the wrong answer today in Britain in 2020. Well, let's follow up with that. Um, there's a sort of comment that I get periodically that Britain isn't Britain anymore. What does that mean? And if, if it's not that, what is it? Yes, and it, is sort of, it sort of doesn't get you sometimes until you see a little bit of footage uh, on the TV or something. And it, it doesn't need to be a long time ago. It doesn't need to be uh, the war years. It could just be footage from 1980s when you remember oh I remember that country I remember London when it looked like that when it felt like my capital city and so all these years later we're very much forced out from within you know I'm an outsider in my own country and I'm a minority in Bradford Birmingham Leicester Luton I could carry on the list is very long and demographically speaking by 2030 Muslim births outnumber births to all other religions. And by 2040, British Christians or British people that aren't Muslim are in the minority in the whole country. And that isn't a problem in and of itself. This isn't anything against any particular religion. It's just that when you are forced out from your own land, when the things that matter to you are seen as wrong, when churches are being burned weekly, by the other religion, uh, when people, you know, I, I get emails often from elderly people and they say to me, they're glad their time is nearly up so they won't have to see their country fall. And that's so upsetting to read, but also that's where I see my motivation is to reassure those uh, elderly couples that there is someone still fighting for what we used to know and to try and carve out a small space where we can still, for me to reassure them they're not on their own. And I think it's something you will understand, Americans understand well right now, is possibly this is one of the loneliest times. People feel more on their own than at any time in their past. And I think people like you and I are here to remind people that actually you're not on your own. We are many. And when we all work together, we are really powerful as a group. 
Well, let's talk about this immigration issue. You raise a point that we talk about here quite a bit, especially uh, it's an attack on Trump to say he's against immigration. Are your borders still open? There is talk after Brexit, where the British people brilliantly on the 23rd of June uh, came out and said, we are going to leave the European Union. We are supposed to be taking back control of our borders. We're supposed to be getting a points-based immigration system. But if I could take you now to the southern coast, the, the white cliffs of Dover, uh, to Kent and the Dover coastline, and we could sit there, we would watch inflatable boats coming across the channel with illegal migrants every single day. They estimate 150 that they know of a day coming into this country illegally. And you could, you could multiply that number out. So we have no control over migration into our country. France is encouraging the migrants to keep moving, to keep coming across. And frankly, because of our overgenerous welfare system and our socialized healthcare system, we are, of course, a target. And, and very briefly, the minute someone set, sets foot in the UK, they are told they are uh, accorded a house, uh, food, uh, money per week, health benefits and legal benefits, even if their asylum is rejected. So why wouldn't you come? And that's the problem we face. Well, yeah, it's the free stuff system that people who are working, who are shouldering the burden, are resentful of. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, are these people that are coming in illegally, are they assimilating? Are they becoming British-ish? Or are they keeping their own culture separate and distinct from the British. And, and that's exactly it. You know, if I hark back briefly to our a brilliant Indian community that came over in the 70s, they're the best of us. They work harder than us, longer than us. Uh, they want to be part of everything. Their children are brilliant and work hard at school. We've had experience of that. This, the Muslim population that is, I say, looking to overthrow my country from within, they want nothing to do with Western culture. They teach in the mosques that our children are dirty because they're uncovered. They use the analogy of a lollipop without the wrapping with flies all over it, that our children can be used by men because they're dirty. Um, there is a sense of them and us, and we are the ones that are somehow always in the wrong. And it's one of, well, there's two questions I have. Maybe your audience will have the answers. Um, number one, why is it, as a minority white in London, Bradford, Luton, Leicester, I don't have any rights at all. Why are there no rights when you're a minority ethnic if you're white? And the second question I have is, is if Islam is so fantastic, why do Muslims always come to seek shelter or refuge or start a new life in Christian countries? You know, and, and that's a question I can never get an answer to either. Why come and change the very thing that offered you shelter or offered you a home? Well, I can answer your second question, and it's in Sharia, which is it's jihad by emigration. And it's the compulsion uh, from Muhammad's dictates to spread the word, his word, and you do that by spreading out and repopulating areas into which you have immigrated. And I think uh, exactly to that point, what happens as well is by the time people start to wake up to this, the damage is already done. The scaffolding and the infrastructure of a complete power grab is already there. So in every city, there is a Muslim mayor including our capital city where we have the nipple height, I'm sorry to embarrass you, uh, Muslim mayor, Sadiq Khan. He is one of the shortest men I've ever met. I don't like short people. Um, you know, they take over the police. There is a Muslim police association, Muslim housing, and mosques, of course, in the, in the uppermost islands. There's only eight people living on some of these islands. They've just built another mosque. So you're completely right about territorial control, stamping authority, owning the substructure of a country before you show your face. And right now, Islam is showing its face. And of course, we only have 20 years left before we are 
we are the minority in our own country. Thanks for joining us on ATP Report today. And a special thank you to Katie Hopkins. Katie, tell our viewers where they can find out about you again, please. Yes, of course. So I'm on Parley, which is P-A-R-L-E-R, -E like the French to speak, Parley. And uh, my name on there is capital K, capital T, Hopkins, K-T, Hopkins. Go check her out. We're on Parler too, by the way. And for yeah. those of you that have not subscribed yet, please take out your cell phones only in the U.S. and type the word truth and send it to 88202, push send. You'll be subscribed to our text message service. It's always free. Every couple of days, you'll get a video like this one with Ms. Hopkins, and you can stay in touch with us. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Newsbaum.